Today, we have a very special guest, and his name is Paul Kinger. He's the best-selling author, historian, professor, and commentator that has written a fascinating book on communism and Karl Marx. So make sure you hit the like button on this video, send it out in the YouTube universe so more people see it. This is an important conversation in today's world where we are beginning to lose our freedom to more and more centralized control. So make sure you share this video on social media and have a conversation about today's topic. Special shout out to our sponsor, Vizla Silver, one of our favorite silver and gold mining stocks. So it's good to see you, Paul. Hey, Jake, good to be with you. Thanks. Okay. So um, why such a focus on Karl Marx and communism, especially in the world today? Well, unfortunately, it's more relevant now than it than it probably has been in a long time. In fact, uh, I graduated from college. My senior year was 1989, 1990. And so I was editor of the editorial page of my student newspaper, the, 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 the fall of 1989, when the Berlin Wall was falling. And we thought all this stuff was behind us. Right. You know, we, we had defeated communism. Communism was finished. This would be the end of it. But I, I got to tell you, though, Jake, it, you know, throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, when I went on to graduate school and, and started teaching, I teach at Grove City College, which is in Grove City, Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania. And I would speak for groups like the Young America's Foundation, ISI, Intercollegiate Studies Institute. And I started getting requests from students all over the country to probably the most requested talk that I've ever given to this day is titled why communism is bad. <laughs> so I would get these desperate pleas from students saying, you wouldn't believe what I'm learning at my college. Believe it or not, I actually have a professor with a bust of Karl Marx in his office, right? And you know, could you please come here and tell us why communism is bad? And so not only would I do that, but to get to your point, your original question, I saw developing you know, over the 90s, the 2000s, the reality that we were not learning any of these lessons about the Cold War, about communism. In fact, the only thing that, that people would hear oftentimes about it was, oh yeah, there's a Cold War, there's a communism. There were bad guys like uh, you know, Joe McCarthy, right? You know, the anti-communists, you know, the people who persecuted the good loving progressives in the Hollywood 10. Right. By the way, every single member of the Hollywood 10 was a Communist Party USA. So tell me, tell me what that is, too. I thought that was interesting. We we're talking about. So just for what is the Hollywood 10? And also, how does it tie into the broader connection that Hollywood has with communism? We've seen John Cena, you know, shilling recently. Yeah. So the Hollywood 10, this was a group of writers, directors, and they were, you know, they're often portrayed in the media. They were called to testify before Congress in October 1947. And they're often portrayed as these kind of good loving progressives, right? These liberals who were unfairly maligned and persecuted for supporting communism. And, and it's often given the impression, and, I, and to be fair, I wonder how many of the professors and people who take this approach even know all the facts on this, but they're often portrayed as these progressives. They weren't really in favor of communism, but in fact, you know, all 10 of them, 10 out of 10, were Communist Party USA members, and that's a big deal. I'll pause right there. If um, in the 1930s and 1940s, and I know this pretty much verbatim off the top of my head, uh, the, the pledge was, I swear myself at all times to remain a firm defender of the Leninist line of the party, the only party that ensures the triumph of Soviet power inside the United States. So they were pledged to Stalin's Soviet Union. You know, that, that was the headquarters of, of, of global communism. They wanted what Earl Browder, William Z. Foster, two of the first heads of the Communist Party USA, called a Soviet America, where to quote Langston Hughes, the USSA will put one more S in the USA to make it Soviet when we take over. So, so they were, and this is a key point too here, Jake, um, frankly, to be honest and, and to be charitable and fair to them, and I guess give, commend them to some degree, most American communists in the 30s and 40s didn't go so far as to join Communist Party USA, because doing that required pledging yourself to the Soviet Union. So you had a lot of American communists, even people like Saul Alinsky, 
who was sympathetic to communism, probably more of a socialist. He said, I could never join Communist Party USA because I could never join an organization that forced me to do th things I didn't want to do. But um, every member of the Hollywood 10 was a CPUSA member. Um, and you know, so, so were so many of the bad guys and gals in the 1940s and 1950s. Now, the word communism, there's a lot of words that are thrown out a lot now, whether it's calling someone a, a white supremacist or using the term Nazi or saying communist or saying capitalist or saying socialist. I feel like as a whole in our world, in, in our let's talk about our country specifically of America, everyone has very different definitions of what these mean. You said right. that one of your most famous speeches was about why communism was bad. So first of all, let's define communism uh, first and foremost, and then how does it tie into what you call democratic socialism? Well, if, if you were talking to Karl Marx right now, or Friedrich Engels, right, the co-authors of the Communist Manifesto, which was published in 1848, and you said to them, uh, Karl Friedrich, in one sentence, can you define communism for me? Actually, Marx would first insult you and call you a bunch of names and call you a dirty ape and all kinds of other stuff first, because is what he did, call you a moron and everything else. And then he would say, read my book, stupid. Right. Uh, you know, as we say, the entire communist theory may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. So if you said, uh, you know, give me four words, he'd say that's easy. Abolition of private property. And then they even say in the Communist Manifesto, they, they, they double down on this, right? They say, people reading this will say, but you intend to do away with private property. And they don't say, well, uh, that's not really what we mean. They say, no, precisely so. <laughs> that, that is exactly what we intend to do. So the, you know, the idea you know, based on biblical law, natural law, Judeo-Christian principles, I mean, the, the cave to the courthouse, I mean, there is nothing more fundamental than the right to own property, right? I mean, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, right? It's just it, basic property rights. So the idea of Marx and Engels that they want to abolish private property, that's just one sign among many. Their, their most famous, their favorite phrase in the manifesto is the word abolish, all right? They use that all the time, abolish, abolish, abolish. Uh, these guys and communists were absolute and utter revolutionaries. They really um, forget about being economists. They weren't economists at all. I mean, these guys were philosophers. They, they were revolutionaries. And you will find no ideology as radical as communism, which also is why I would say you'll find no ideology as responsible for as many deaths as communism, which is why. Yes, this is something uniquely that people shouldn't mess around with. This isn't like being a Democrat or a Republican or a liberal or a conservative. I mean, this is this is really radical stuff. So the discussion of communism, I feel like the average person then says, maybe interesting, I agree with you, but not very relevant to America today. You know, nobody's out there saying we're going to be communists. What's your response to that and how it fits into the relevance in, in today? Well, a lot of them are saying that. In fact, there's a recent poll that about a quarter of millennials support the abolition of private property. It's just unbelievable stuff, right? And uh, we can get to socialism in a minute, but going back to about 2010 now, I know because I chronicle this every year, Gallup and others started finding more Americans saying that they prefer socialism over capitalism. And that's now an actual majority among millennials and including among registered Democrats. The number of people praising communism. And let me add this. I think without a question, the most popular organization in America today is Black Lives Matter. And you said people aren't going around saying we're Marxists. Well, well Patrice Cullors, who's the founder of BLM, says Alicia and I, that's Alicia Garza. So there were there were three founders of uh, Black Lives Matter, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Patrice was the president and CEO. She recently resigned, by the way, um, under pressure from people within Black Lives Matter who didn't like any of this stuff, right? And, and she said, Alicia and I, we are trained Marxists. We are Marxist organizers. This is our ideological framework. 
quote, we are really super versed in ideological theories, unquote, including critical race theory, which of course um, has a Marxist basis as well. So, so unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are supporting this, and there are even today elected members of Congress, at least four of them, um, the, the, the squad among them, who are actual formal member of the Democratic Socialists of America. And if you go to the DSA's website, it calls itself the largest socialist organization in the United States. So I know what your next question is, right? What's yes. the difference between socialism and communism, right? Yeah, not just in theory, though. What's the yeah. difference between your your average progressive that says, look, you know, we just want some more. We want it to be more fair and we want the rich people to tax more. So sure, call me a democratic socialist if that's what you want to call me. Well, yeah. So if if if, if they say that, call me that, you shouldn't say that because that's not socialism, right? Why? A, f- a friend of mine emailed me that not long ago and she said, my neighbor said, you want socialism? Well, the government comes and paves your roads. That's socialism. <laughs> no, 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 it, no, it's not. It, 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 it's not. And, and people on my side, the conservative side, are just as guilty of this, right? Of saying, oh, you, you advocate that? You're a commie, right? Just like people on the left, right? The first time I got called a fascist was, was when I wrote an article in my student newspaper on, on arming the Contras. And I got called a Nazi for this, right? I'll never forget my dad picking me up from college saying, you got called a what? A <laughs> Nazi? And I, and, I, and I said, yeah. He said, what are you writing about Hitler? I said, no, I'm not writing about Hitler. And if I was, it wouldn't be positive, right? I said, no, I wrote a piece of the Contras in Nicaragua. And you got called a Nazi? I said, yeah, dad, it's crazy. These people on the left. They call you everything. You're going to get for everything. In fact, my my second column, I got called a racist for writing a piece saying that the homelessness wasn't the fault of Reagan. Right. I don't think I even I'm sure I didn't mention black people anywhere in the whole piece. But uh, but so you got to be careful about calling people names and exaggerating, exaggerating things. But a, a true socialist. All right. And if you. If you go to Google right now, um, which is a really messed up search engine, well, I shouldn't say this because you'll probably forget, scratch that. We don't want to get your show banned. But if you go to Google, if you go to any of the search engines, you type in the word socialism, right? Typically, any time over the last 20 years, what will pop up is socialism, definition, common ownership of the means of production. That's like a universally held definition of socialism. And it's the idea that you know, things are publicly owned, government owned, right? State owned means of production. And communism too favors public ownership or common ownership of the means of production. And according to Marxist Leninist theory, Marx, Engels, Lenin, they all said this, communism is the final, with socialism is the final transitionary step leading to communism. So history would pass through this series of dialectical stages or phases. You'd go from feudalism to slavery, to capitalism, to socialism, to communism. So socialism would be the final transitionary stage to communism. So yeah, that's really what what socialism is. Now, today you get the problem of people who say, well, I'm not that kind of a socialist either. I'm a democratic socialist, right? And, and usually you find that they're making up their own definitions. If you go to the Democratic Socialists of America website, that which calls itself, quote, the largest socialist organization in the United States, quote unquote, right? And they have, I think now, close to 100,000 members. They are the largest socialist organization in the United States. I mean, they call themselves socialists. And if you read their platforms and read their stuff, they're really socialists. They really are. And if you follow them online, go to some of their chat groups, they're calling each other comrade. <laughs> they're opening their international conferences by singing the International. Just look it up on YouTube. You can watch them do it. You'll, you'll look it up and say, wow, he's right. They're actually singing. It. Look at this. So they. Uh, so it depends on how people define this. But, but if you, um, okay, let me say this. If you want more like a Swedish, Scandinavian, or maybe Canadian or British or Denmark kind of third way model, even assuming that those countries are third way, which they're really not anymore, you're favoring there probably what's better called social democracy. Okay. And I know this is hard because the words sound a lot alike. 
But those are more like social democracies. They are not democratic socialism. They are not socialism. So people need to be a lot more careful with what they say and the language that they use. Now, that said, to have people like the you know, founder of BLM running around today, she's not saying, oh, it's OK. I'm a I'm a democratic socialist. I, I believe in social democracy. She's saying, oh, no, we're trained Marxists. We spent a year up here. This is her memoirs right here, right? Um, we spent a year reading Marx, Lenin, Mao, right? On, you know, that, so right. that's an altogether different cat. And that's, um, it, the Marxism matters. You saw maybe last week or whenever it was, um, people sent me, um, hey, look, at BLM is praising Cuba, of all things. Well, yeah. I, I mean, does that surprise you? The foreword is by Angela Davis. And the lead quote in the book is by Osada Shakur, who, who, who's, who's been in Cuba since, since, since she broke out of jail for, for a life sentence of, for, for killing, for, for, for the murder of a, of a police officer in the New, New Jersey Turnpike in the 1970s. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the Marxism matters. The stuff matters. Okay, so I know we have a limited time. There's there's so much that I want to ask you because you know I I I feel like your conversation right now is is very important. So I'll say this. So one of the reasons I think that it's really important is because I feel like there's a hybrid of this type of totalitarian control that's being built in that it's using the corporate world. I read a book on um, the Nazis in the in the ending stages of surrender when the German government surrendered and the Nazis used corporations to essentially continue on. And so now we have, you know, a centralized power of corporations, the censorship of information, PayPal announced today that they're working with the ADL and they're going to now begin um, uh, monitoring people for what they, you know, blanketly call uh, white supremacy. Yeah. And so you can see how this type of social credit score model built in China could be easily applied in America due to a few centralized corporations having so much of the power. Um, do you share that sentiment? And how do you, if not, how do you believe the push towards a total, if we don't even call it communism, we just call it totalitarianism. How do you believe that push can and will continue to be made? Well, and even, even if not totalitarianism, right? Centralization, okay. excessive government power. And look, remember the Nazis were socialists, right? You know, this was the national, uh, the German Nationalist Socialist Workers Party, right? I mean, this, this was a left of center group. Uh, Mussolini, who was a fascist, Mussolini was a Marxist. Um, in fact, I, I talk a lot in um, The Devil and Karl Marx and, and my Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism about Mussolini. And I, I mean, Mussolini, you know, Lenin admired Mussolini. He said, wow, this is somebody who really gets it. That, that Mussolini in Italy, he, he, he really understands this. So, so yeah, that's very much a threat. And it really bothers me how people on the so-called liberal left, right, will, um, will join corporations and these other groups in order to censor and control. And, you know, not to get into the whole COVID vaccine and everything right now, but um, I wrote a piece for Crisis Magazine called My Body, My Choice. You know, liberals have been running around saying that for, for decades in advocacy of the right to abortion. And now here's liberals trying to tell you you have to forcibly get vaccinated, even if you've already had COVID like I did. And I used to work in immunology. I mean, I, I had COVID. I have natural immunity. I don't need a vaccine right now. And they won't even let you do that, right? They, they, wanna, they wanna force you. And, and, and in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a risk right now about talking about this on your show because you, you could have this show could suddenly get banned just because I'm going into a COVID discussion. 
when our original point was to talk about about communism. So that kind of thing is 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 really disturbing. I, I mean, a genuine liberal, a genuine progressive really ought to believe in the free exchange of ideas. But as we've seen on universities, university campuses, right, that's not the case at all. Diversity is um, is a buzzword, just like tolerance is, whereas um, they end up giving you a very narrowly prescribed set of ideas, and anybody who questions them is not tolerated. No diversity for that. Yeah, you know, you hit the nail on the head, and that's why I made this new channel was to separate it from, as I told you, my main channel and my main business because I wanted to talk about things that, you know, are they're they're important. So, do you? Hmm. All right. So, do you think that this is an organized movement? You know, because if you look top down from Federal Reserve, you have a centralized financial system. You want to centralize uh, uh, medical control. You want to centralize speech. You know, you talk about AOC and these types of people. Are these all just lone actors with their own motives? Or does this all tie in to some people have said the conspiracy for many years, Mm -hmm. Alex Jones types of people have said there's a move towards using corporations to essentially build a one world type of, of control system that is using a social credit score system uh, and, and, your dig- and your Fed digital wallet tying into all these things. Um, is there an organized movement or is this just people uh, having motives that are good in nature that are manifesting themselves uh, as, as, con- as control? Um, uh, to accomplish those ends? Well, I think it started with that, the, you know, the, the uh, latter, right? And it's, it's, part of, it's part of the zeitgeist. It's part of what, you know, my editor, the American Spectator, R.M. Terrell called for a long time, the culture smog, right? It's what they breathe. It's the circles that they run in. It's how they think. It's what they do on the universities. I mean, there's no organized conspiracy at the universities, and yet all this garbage is coming out of the universities. It's simply what they teach. It's what they believe. And of course, now to some level, you're in a situation where they, they can start to conspire, if you will, collaborate, right? Um, get together and deplatform you. Um, get together and ban you. Uh, a group like the Southern Poverty Law Center calling my friends at the Family Research Council a hate group, right? And so now anytime anybody types in Family Research Council, hate group pops up, right? So, so after a while, they, they can start to work together and collaborate. And, and I suppose there can be some degree of conspiracy that's actually involved. And ironically, to sort of circle that back to communism, in, in the early days of communism, it was a conspiracy, right? The Soviet Union would seek to organize the world through the common term, the communist international, right? There'd be, there'd be, the goal was a one world communist state organized through the common term. What you see now is not that. The common term was abolished a long time ago, Soviet Union over 30 years ago. But today you see this altogether different form of American Marxism, to borrow from Mark Levin's title in his book, that's made up of all these disparate groups of um, group politics, oppressed versus the oppressors, right? Based on gender, based on sexuality, based on race, critical race theory, gender feminists, Marxist feminists, all these different groups where, where it has no longer anything to do with even class and economics. So, um, but yeah, so it sounds like I'm a little bit all over the place here. And maybe what I'm kind of giving you with an answer is that it's not a conspiracy. It's just kind of out there and all over the place. It's what people have been taught. But what's indeed troubling is that these people can get together now and through the power of social media and everything else, they can uh, they can ban you. They can banish you. They can silence you. They can ruin you. They can shut you down. And that's uh, that's very alarming. How does the Chinese communist tie into the relevance of this today, you know, we've seen we we're aware of the tie in between professional sports, the NBA, right. um, Hollywood, John Cena, you know, making his famous Chinese apology for calling Taiwan a country. So we are, you know, then we know 
uh, officially that from the from the FBI that that was Hunter Biden's laptop. He was working with Chinese communist agents. So we see this, and and it's not just Democrats. Many of the well known Republicans that stick around are are we know are getting Chinese money as well. And so you see an infiltration of Chinese communism. And there are some people saying that xenophobic and it's nothing to worry about. Then on the other extreme, there's people saying that the Chinese communists are going to invade us tomorrow and they're going to you know, be controlling America. How does Chinese communism and their influence tie into today's relevance of this discussion? Yeah, I think that's even more complicated. And in fact, I just read last week a comment from Marco Rubio asking Major League Baseball um, why they're not complaining about what's going on in Cuba. They've got a huge number of Cuban nationals, defectors, that, that play Major League Baseball. And this was right, you know, MLB yanked the All-Star game out of Atlanta because Rob Manfred, the Major League Baseball commissioner, bought into Stacey Abrams and Joe Biden's political caricature of Georgia's new election integrity laws. And yet, of all things, here's Major League Baseball not condemning anything going on in Cuba, working with uh, Cuba, working with China. Same thing with it, with the NBA and these other groups. So you've got LeBron James and others, right? These groups that are so woke and, and so quick to, 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 to drop you over something like your opposition to a COVID vaccine or they believe where you stand on X, Y or Z issue. And then on the other hand, more than happy to take a gazillion dollars from from communist China. So. Um, so, yeah, no, that's uh, very, very disturbing, very troubling. Well, how does it tie in? So are they are the Chinese communists trying to take over America by destabilizing it uh, as opposed to a military war? Have they used a fiat currency system to put agents involved and in, and in, in they're intending to. Uh, uh, infiltrate and build communism in America as an extension, or is that is that too far of a step? And they're just looking to make more money. Yeah, and I'm gonna say, it's going to sound like I'm dodging the question by saying it, it's immensely complicated. But what makes China so different from like the Soviet Union? So the Soviet Union did have a literal communist international. They they wanted a global Soviet state. And all the other communist parties in the world, every country would have one communist party. America's would be Communist Party USA, which was started, if you go way back, September 1919 in Chicago. They would all answer to the common term. The Kremlin would literally run the whole thing. With China, it's a totally different situation where you have this, this communist party controlled state that allows enough market freedom and free markets that it's able to, to you know, economically succeed. Which is why China is so weird. It, it's politically communist, but not really economically communist. If it was economically communist, it wouldn't be such a wealthy country, right? So, so I, I see China as this communist party-led country that's looking to be the dominant hegemon, the dominant power in the world, and indeed looking to surpass the United States, and probably through kind of some real politic Machiavellian gestures, is going to do whatever it can to get there. And I would think that they're probably much happier with Joe Biden as president than they are with Donald Trump, because you know Trump was was very uh, very anti-China and much more willing to take him on, including on tariffs, than Joe Biden will be. Okay, so I know your time is valuable. We're coming here in the last minute or two, so my final question is. Um, when we're looking at everything that's happening right now, what's the most important uh, way to stop this? What are you teaching to you, your professor? What are you trying to impart the message, the the sense of urgency, uh, and and hopefully a solution? Yeah, educate, educate, educate. Shows like yours. Um, Books like, you know, mine and other people are writing, you've got to get this information to people and the young people in particular. I mean, when, when I hear, Jake, somebody say, oh, the Communist Manifesto is a pretty good book if you just read it, you know, I, they, they haven't read it. In fact, I'll say all the time, really, have you read it? 
Uh, well, you know, I kind of skipped around a little bit. And, and, the, and the way they're pushing it through the universities is not by reading it. Because if you just read this junk, I, I mean, you realize right away, especially anybody with a business mind, go through the pages of the, of the Communist Manifesto, the main section. You'll read this and you'll say, these guys are nuts. You can't do this, which is why, too, by the way, sometimes people will say, well, one thing Marx had right. He was just accurately describing how bad the Industrial Revolution abuses were of the 19th century. Well, OK, if that's true, guess what? We're not in the 19th century anymore. All right. OK, so the only thing he got right was that Can we move on. And in fact, all the Marxists today, they're not doing that. They're not doing the economics class based stuff. They're doing they're doing cultural forms, gender, sexual forms. Right. Racial forms of Marxism. So we um, we just need to get information out to people. And because young people aren't learning this stuff in their schools and their universities, uh, use this medium, use the Internet, use use the Web to um, to try to help teach people what's what's true, what's accurate. Okay, so uh, thanks for joining us. You have a new book that came out just last year. Uh, we'll link that right there down below. You want to tell us what it is and, and uh, why someone should give it a read? Sure, thanks. Yes, yeah, so I wrote a book called The Devil and Karl Marx, which goes into Marx's religious views, anti-religious views. And I did a book, um, I've done about 20 books, but another one that related to this, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism, which is really written for young people in particular, and if people want to follow me, I write for the American Spectator, which is spectator.org. So you could go there and see all my old archive columns. I write about this stuff all the time. If you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure you share it with a friend. Maybe you could even hook it up to your television and watch it with a couple of your friends. Hit that like button. Give us a comment right there down below if you enjoyed today's episode. And we want to thank you very much for coming on, Paul, and appreciate the work you're doing and want to encourage everyone to go grab a copy of his book right now.